one engine. Two engines. It all comes about initially because the biggest power plant for trucks was about 200 horsepower. Now our guys have got a whole bunch of trucks, mostly UK based. The biggest engine would be an eight cylinder Gardener, 150 horsepower. Because of the war surplus sales, they're getting hold of Detroit Diesel, General Motors Diesels, they're 205 horsepower. But they're getting these out of the General Grand tanks and wherever they could find them and doing repowers on various of the trucks. You got nothing bigger than 205 horsepower. And of course, they've got this drag in from the mine side into Headland. They're dreaming of something bigger. And the way to go there was two engines, which is what the Ridley has and the initial plot was to drag two trailers. On these huge tyres, I think they contemplated a road speed of about 25 miles an hour. Wind on roads would go out in the project, they go up north, they talk to Lang Hancock and they got involved with tin mining and all sorts of stuff. Out the front of our workshop was a gravel area near the fuel bars and Don used to get Harold out there and he came out with a stick and he'd say Harold we want we draw up there we got it, and that's got to go and connect up to this and that's got to go over there and they'd be just kicking stuff around with gravel out there and then, then Harold would go back you won't believe this Harold used to go to the local hardware store and buy his eight before sheets of masonite he used to buy 12 or 15 at a time in his office we got off in the morning we'd come in there carry out these sheets on the floor colour pencils drawing out bits and pieces of the Rose Ridley in scale. There was no, no engineer drawings ever made on the, on the Rose Ridley, to my knowledge. The regulations were changed whereby any road in Western Australia could come under the control of Main Roads Department. Oh. And that was specially put forward to stop these private roads. So yeah, that knocked it on the head. And when this one come out of the shop and was tested, the law come out and had a look at it and they straight away condemned it. Everything was wrong. It was left hand drive, it was too big. We were contractors, not truck builders. So they just bloody didn't allow it on the road. It had never even done a maiden voyage. And it, it, Hal just jumped in and drove it up there with all the trailers. How he ever knew that that truck was going to go up Bindoon Hill and all that with all them trailers on. And I remember Hal telling me this from the horse's mouth. They had 75 tonne on it. And the coppers said to them, no, nah, you're not allowed to put any more on it. And they put another 25 tonne on it. So I carried a hundred ton all the way up there. It was the obvious, and I can understand the uh, trepidation that the boys would have felt. Hell, you know, here's this brand new thing, and we're taking on one hell of a journey. They went up the inland road, turn off at Woburn, then up through Paints Find and Meeker and up into that area. And so it was pretty isolated and tough old terrain. And there were people that sort of poo-pooed it and sort of said, you'll never get that bloody thing up there without massive breakdown. Well, the only thing that went wrong on the whole trip was one flat tyre. We put a crushing plant and a screening plant and it's all the gear for the mine on the trailers truck moved it around the mine, put it into place and then the truck went and buddy sat up on a hill and had two big gen sets on the back and that used to supply the electricity for the crusher 
and the camp and all that sort of stuff. That's what it's done all its life. In 1967, we were sent up to Woody Woody to do repair work, and that's when I first saw it. Yeah, I, I remember clearly opening the door and, and getting in and sitting on the seat and then realising that I could actually stand up in the cab. Yeah, and now, um, all these years later, I can almost jump up and down. <laughs> decided to go and have a serious look at it, you know, and that's when Glenn Roberts took us out. It was just to see if we could work out if we could actually load it. That was the big problem without a big crane, you know. Took the old tape measure and all that, measured it all up, and I thought, well, we can have a go. We did see potential. It wasn't beyond repair by any means. And, uh, you know, the chassis and that was still in good order. There were opponents missing, like fuel tanks, drive lines, um, air tanks. The engines had already been taken out legitimately in about 1970. That was all okay. She'd been shot a few times, hadn't it? Yeah, plenty of bullet holes. We had to get it out of the ground for a start and, and chalk it up and then start again. And we went up sort of um, step by step. It was tedious. We worked into the evening and then uh, next morning started again. We, and that was the all day. day. But there was no way we were stopped. Ken actually came and saw me because, you know, I've been part of the, uh, the DFD thing and he asked whether or not we'd release it back to the family. And my concern was that it was going to leave there, come down and sit behind a shed and just be forgotten forevermore. That's what I was concerned about. And I said to Ken, I, that's the last thing I want to see happen. And he said, if you release it back to the family, he said, I guarantee that we will start restoration on it immediately. And he went a little further and said, I'd like to see it done before we lose mum. My immediate response was, come and get it. The roads really turned up and we started from scratch. Bill just had a chassis from the start all got painted black and you know we could see where it was going to go and I couldn't believe how big it was. See and that cap's got all wood in it and see the heat of the day and that's what made the wood deteriorate it just sort of rotted and I made all the, the new panels the bonnet and the sun visor and the panels inside the cab. Scrounge around wreckers find them somewhere or if it was a part that could be made just to sit down and make it. When we finished contracting the engines were brought back here and then when it was given to Terry Bobby Devlin used to pour sump oil all over them to stop them from going rusty but when the wind blew and the dust the dust sat on the sump oil and about here set like cement on them. The outside but that was terrible but Perseverance, sitting on a milk crate alongside an engine, buddy, scraping that for days, not just one day, day. We went for a test ride and Ken went escort and we took it up the Kalamunda Hill. Yeah, and, oh, it went beautiful, yeah. Oh, it drove like a train, beautiful. Yeah. In fact, we were going down Welshville Road and there was a Kenworth there and there was no room for him. He, he had to fall back and, and wait till we um, went around the corner. It was quite funny. Yeah, and the looks you got from people, you know, the, what the blooming hell is this? Because I remember this chap waiting on the T junction to turn right onto Qdale Road, and we actually him, Bill drove it and coming up, and the bloke's face he, 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 it was like August Moon, you know. And, and his exact words, he, he beat us back to the workshop, and he said he'd worked in Port Hedland for years at one time, and he said he was looking at the truck coming up in his own mind. He was saying that Jesus Christ, this truck's huge, you know. And look at the radiator and he said, I've only ever seen one radiator in all my life like that. 
and he said, it's a Rhodes Ridley. And he said, it is the bloody Rhodes Ridley. He couldn't believe it. So even Bill turned right and went down to Max Winkler's there, or, or the Kewdale Road there. And, and you, but anyhow, he was waiting for us. So I couldn't bloody believe it. He said, I thought this thing was, had it. And Bill said, no, no, she'd not had it. One engine turned off, second engine off.